Thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is a Tech for Non-Tech meetup. Each of these events are held um, in Belfast League Centre in Silicon Alleyway. So like um, this is a event that's part of Reus Ventures. Reus Ventures is a startup accelerator. And uh, what the Reus do is they take new businesses and bring them, sort of uh, give them the business skills that they, they need to want to like take their, accelerate their business to the next level. And uh, what Tech for Non-Tech it does is, is even, but, like uh, getting new sort of founders who maybe aren't really, don't have the understanding of technology or don't really know what tech is, but maybe want to go tech product. So what these uh, events do gives people, give founders sort of skills to uh, sort of understand the technology a bit more. And tonight we have Leif McCauley, Bajar Siddiq and Ellie McBride himself. And uh, Leif is a, a marketer, Ellie is a product productivity expert and Bajar is a no code uh, producer. And uh, myself, I'm a designer, but um, today the four of us are going to talk to you about marketing, automation, no code, and productivity. So, Ali is going to kick us off today, and then uh, I'm going to make her the host. So, let's go. I'm just in the middle of rearranging my screens. I'll be with you in two seconds, friends. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna move you all over here. I'm not sure, oh, sorry. All right, and I, everyone see my slides? We good? Yes, all good. Yes. <laughs> so this is much, much better. So talking about automation and scheduling in your business and to make things more streamlined and take a lot of the admin work out for you. A little bit about me. Um, my name is Ellie McBride, and I am the only person, really, is part, currently I have a um, part-time assistant, but for Calibrated <laughs> Concepts. And I started out as a specialist virtual assistant working in tech, uh, social media content, and, and that really spurred me into working more and more with Squarespace websites and email marketing. So, and that is everything from designing the lead magnet with an email marketing system through getting all the nitty gritty like automation sorted so that it's just kind of tick, 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 and it's really smooth for your, your end customer. Um, and the same is kind of what I do with Squarespace is I make sure that everything is really automatic. Your booking systems are in place. Your um, essentially everything that I can take off your plate admin wise, I make sure to do in the automations I create for my clients. And so that way, Essentially, what I used to say when I was a, just in a, a virtual assistant was essentially I was trying to put myself out of work. Like there should be so many systems and automations and processes in your business that you don't need a virtual assistant. Um, and for the most part. So um, I'm originally from Oregon in the United States. Um, I moved here about three years ago after marrying a local. I have a Springer Spaniel named Bailey and I'm always on the hunt for good craft beer because it's very limited in Northern Ireland. Um, and that's, that's a bit about me. So we'll dive in now. Um, the biggest categories I see in businesses for automating and creating systems are around social media scheduling, project management, appointment scheduling and booking, which kind of go hand in hand, and time management. So why you should take the time to set these up. So obviously setting up these automations and systems takes a little bit of time at the, at the beginning, but when you've set up the, the, the tools and the software and the templates and anything else you might talk about today, it saves you hours and hours. Knowing that you have a templated email for that one email that you receive like 15 times a day, like saves you time, not having to rewrite that, or that even if you receive it five times a month, that is time you are saving because it is an, an automated process or a system that never, ever changes. On the other side of that, it's also really good, again, to your client or end user because it provides a consistency of brand. If you're always responding to the same requests in the same way, it isn't like that is so, so important. And I worked when I first moved to Belfast, I worked for a really small little startup here and it, I really struggled in that environment, actually, as much as I, I enjoy working for myself because that startup did not value the idea of creating systems and processes or like having their documents easily findable, consistent client communication where they had scripts for um, customer support type roles. 
none of it was there. And it meant that everything that they were doing took way, way more energy, time and effort and therefore money than it should have. So the first thing that I talk about a lot is social media scheduling. And I think we'll get more into that. And so this is just really basic, but for keeping a really simple social media system is going to be about creating a content library, keeping everything in one place, all of your images, all of your text, the copywriting that you may have had done or that you've done yourself, um, all in one place so that as you're going and scheduling and batching it out, which we'll get to, it's all just right at your fingertips. Or if you're outsourcing that bit, again, it's right at the fingertips of the person that you're having help you. Then you go on to make a, a really simple plan. So think about the types of things that you need to convey to your customers, who you are, you wanna think about what you can offer them, why they should care and what hurdles they're wanting to overcome, like things that they might think, ooh, I don't know if I should hire them for that just yet. And the things you need to get them past. So educating them, and that when that's a really, really basic social media like content plan. And then using a social media scheduler. So I write all my social media posts and I mostly focus on Instagram because that's where I like to hang out personally. That's, that's it. That's my only reason. <laughs> and I schedule out my Instagram posts between two and four weeks at a time. And so that way they're, re they're relevant to what's happening really realistically in my business but I'm only doing that every once in a while. I'm not spending every day figuring out what I'm posting automatically. So the next thing is on appointments. And this is a big one that I see a lot of people taking the time to do the back and forth, back and forth about, oh, when are you free to book this meeting? Blah. Um, and it's really, really easy to use a tool like Acuity or Calendly, or even if you're looking for a more kind of all-in-one that does all of your things, like Dubsado, to integrate with your calendar, set your availability, set your boundaries, so how far in advance they can book, to how, um, like how many, so how far in advance, as in like 30 rolling days, but also how far in advance. So if you only want it, nobody can book more than three hours before that appointment window so that you're not always surprised with these meetings um, and those types of things. So setting in your boundaries, then they also have resources for if you're managing a team. So managing the various types of appointments that other team members may be taking. And so these types of tools are invaluable, are very, very affordable and save ridiculous time. Like I, my second job in Belfast was working for a law firm and I was a legal secretary and I swear that like a third of my job could have been replaced by Calendly or Acuity <laughs> just trying to set meetings in somebody's diary. Um, the other benefits these have is that you can put in intake forms, custom reminders, some of them you can even add in your like terms and conditions, um, some of them you can set up recurring or subscription payments. So um, group courses. So there's a lot that can be done with these as far as booking and appointments. Right, EJ. You take those links and then you just share them in the relevant places. They're the, they're the button on your website. You can embed them into your website. You, they're the link maybe in your social media post then, and that way, or in that, you know, templated email you're sending to a client. I have my client booking link at the, in the signature for all of my emails. Um, and that way my clients always know that they can reach me at, and then they have a set, you know, I take client calls between three and 5 PM. So it's a really simple system that means that I don't ever have to think about I'm free at this time. Like people book with me, even I, I have it down to, even if like a business friend wants to meet me for a virtual coffee, they still book in because I, I'm me. And that's, I like everything to be really set. And the next thing that I want to talk about kind of goes hand in hand with that, and that is time management. So as a virtual assistant, this is something I worked with people with around a lot. And people often want, know they're too busy, know they're overwhelmed, know they're stressed out, and they don't really know what to do about that. They're like, okay, I need help, but I can't even figure out where I should start with that. And so what I usually advise is that people do a few things. One is make a list of what they do and what needs to be done. 
start timing those processes. So actually start tracking your time using something free like toggle, start tracking your time. So you know how much time those things are taking up. Then you can say, okay, that's really not worth the time that I'm putting into sending those emails out. Like I need to outsource to somebody who's cheaper and more efficient and I can spend that time making money for my business. Right? So what can you automate? What can you delegate? And then after you've done that, so you can set your process. And one of the ways that I do is creating another thing that is really common in my industry is to talk about SOPs, which is standard operating procedures. So it's the set way you do something over and over and over and over again. And it means that nothing gets missed. Every box gets ticked. And there's multiple ways to do this. One is you can create a Google doc and it's like, make sure you do these steps. You can create a Loom video, which is what I typically do. And that's a free, another free platform where you create videos, screen captures. And I, I have an assistant and every time I send him a task, I do it first. I show him exactly what I've done and then I send it to him and I know he can watch that video over and over again. He's incredibly detail oriented and I don't even have to sweat ever thinking about that task again. Um, so, and then the other ways you could do it or are like a project management tool, which is something that I use quite heavily in my business as well. And then the next thing you want to do is make sure that you've, all the other things you've automated, you've outsourced, but you're still busy because we're like, that's essentially how business goes, right? You're always busy with something. And so you want to set the right work environment. And that it can be a lot of things like sitting in the same place, making sure your work environment's tidy, those types of things. But more importantly, I want to talk about time blocking. So this is essentially a fancy word for like batching tasks, where you do the same type of task for a set amount of time. So you say that from nine to 9.30, you only work on emails. Then you do not check your inbox again until the next time that you've set it for. And that means that over, so what, the way I do it is that I have a time block that I do client calls. I have a time block that I'm working on bites and those types of projects. Times that I'm working specifically on content for my own business. And then I have times that I'm working on the last of my VA clients because I'm kind of phasing that side of my business out. I do my best to minimize distractions by doing things like um, on Mac, you can scroll down when you're in the notifications bar and set do not disturb. And I set disturb like almost every day that I'm in the office because those little Slack notifications can really drive you nuts all day. Um, and so I turn my phone on mute because I've booked it so that all of my clients have to book in with a call for me. I don't have to worry about doing that. Like I know that like my clients know that if they just ring me up, they're not getting answered. <laughs> like that's just how it kind of works in my business. And that's acceptable because I've set those boundaries really strictly in my client onboarding process where when they get their, you know, they get their welcome package, they know this is how it works to work with me. And that's along the setting boundaries. So I set boundaries with each of my clients where we use, they have to like, essentially I track everything in Asana. They know how my payment systems work they know what my contract is like and they get all of this really nicely dripped out from the beginning in an email sequence and this means that there are no questions i'm not constantly having to hold their hand i found in the first year of my business the most draining part was onboarding new clients and it was because because it was the system was over and over again and i felt like and, and it kind of worked both ways where I actually got some feedback when I hosted kind of a questionnaire dinner party thing with some of my ideal clients and some of my current clients about a year ago that they wanted more handholding. They wanted to know exactly what to expect. And the second I did that and put this email sequence in, it made my life so much easier. And I found that even for various parts of my business, I was able to duplicate the email sequence and make small tweaks so that my website um, sequence is very slightly different from my email marketing sequence, but it was, and it took very little work to do that. So some of the, my suggested tools for some of these things, I use a sauna for project. Oh, did I miss one? Hmm. There is no slide on project management for some reason, but I'll just talk about that for a second. Project management in my business. I started out in Trello. I've used Dubsado. I have, I mostly use Asana now. And the reason for that is because I can create a new board for every single client, add them just to that board. 
and they can see all the tasks that I'm working on. I don't have to constantly provide them with updates for what I'm doing because I just put it in Asana. They can drop documents, comments, tasks, back and forth, communication around what we're doing. And then my favorite part, as opposed to other project management tools, is that I have one to-do list. So Asana keeps track of what's happening in all of those boards. And I have one to-do list and can see all of my due dates and what I have to get done that day. And it makes my life way, way better. I will say that if you're like, it, there's a range of project management tools starting from Trello, which is super, super user friendly up to like ClickUp, which is like kind of like a sauna on crack. But if your project like need really heavy duty project management, it is amazing. Um, I've used it with teams with multiple businesses underneath because I, one of my long-term clients is an online business manager and she has like you know, seven or eight businesses underneath, and we all are able to keep track of exactly what's happening every day. So project management tools are so essential because they keep everybody on the same page. And even if you're not working or online at the same time, it makes it really, really easy for everyone to feel like they know what's, what's up. So my last slide is just this, some of my favorite tools for this. Um, Asana is a project management tool. Dubsado is an all-in-one. It handles scheduling, finance, um, automation, emails, so, so much in there. And it's not even that expensive and it's a really good all in one. Um, Slack, obviously most of you will know boomerang for Gmail. This is a personal boundary for me. I like to be able to pause my inbox at the night so that if I'm using my laptop for personal use, if I'm watching, so if I'm uh, cooking in the kitchen or whatever, like I don't see my em emails because I, my personality type, if I see them, I need to action them. So this saves my, my sanity. Um, Loom is, like I said, great for recording those screen captures and teaching people things. Um, Acuity scheduling is kind of a really good heavy duty scheduler that does a lot so that you can, like I said, do classes, you can do subscription based things. So if you're like a coach or something, or you do, maybe you do consulting they can book in a three month consulting package and it takes the subscription payment and prompts them to schedule a meeting. Um, Calendly is the way more simple version of scheduling. It's the one I use in my business because I don't usually use those subscription packages. And then Zapier is really good for connecting your tools that may not automatically integrate. So that's it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing and pass, the, um, pass things back over. Oh, awesome, okay. Ellie. Thanks very much. To admit. Do you want to and... pass it over to me and then I'll just do a week quick yes. introduction to Neve. So that was a brilliant talk, Ellie. Thanks very much for presenting there. Uh, no I see it. Just one quick question. I like, see out of all the productivity tools, like what is the, like what is the sort of, maybe not even the best tool, but what's like the most productive tool that you've come across? So the tool that I genuinely think, and I remember that I am a solo entrepreneur and I have one, one assistant, but I think for small teams, the one tool that I literally could not do a single day without in my business is FreshBooks Cloud Accounting. I use it for my accounting software. I use it to track my incoming, my expenses, my invoices. It integrates with Squarespace, which I use religiously and build my websites on, um, so that any sales that come through that are automatically there. But it also does time tracking, project tracking, so like internally, so that my, I can say something to my assistant that isn't in the Slack board or the Asana board that my client can see. Um, and it has really awesome reports and then I can track like my, my team's time too. So I have one assistant and so I can see where he's at so that I know at the end of the month, how much I'm paying him. Right. Okay. Cool. That's, that's awesome. Um, we've just let everyone know we've actually added, um, questions on the Slido app. So if you want to, I posted the question link or the links to the questions in the chat there. So if you have any questions for Ellie or Neve or the jar, um, we'll actually do more questions at the end of the talk. So I'll just start by introducing Neve McCauley now. Uh, Neve sort of came on my radar just through LinkedIn really, because um, I haven't really seen anyone actually doing LinkedIn video well. And um, Neve seems to be doing LinkedIn video incredibly well. And not only she does it well, she just seems to have like a sort of niche almost where she just does LinkedIn marketing. and. Um, I'm just very impressed with all the work she's done. So I thought she would be a really good person to bring on to talk to us about technology and how she uses um, 
video apps. So that's a pretty poor introduction, but if you want to take it away. Yeah, Maeve, but an introduction. Uh, I'm very privileged for that introduction. <laughs> I'll uh, make you the host. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So I'm the host now. Right, so I was going to do some slides, but then I thought um, that I would just talk from experience and connect you up to my phone and just show you the apps that I'm talking about because um, it's so much easier if I just demonstrate exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Um, so first of all, a bit about myself. Um, I am a videographer. Um, I have dabbled in marketing in the last couple of years, but um, first and foremost, I was doing uh, promotional videos for businesses. Um, and I have all my major equipment around me, but at the moment in the last couple of years, I have literally just been using um, my mobile phone. So all the videos I put up on to LinkedIn, all the videos that are getting me like 90% of my work are all filmed on my mobile phone. Even though I'm doing uh, businesses videos on my DSLR camera, all my own videos are actually on my phone. Um, so I would say about six years ago when um, videos were first becoming popular on social media, it was totally different back then. Um, I know I'm saying that like it's ages ago, but it's really not, but technology changes so, so quickly. Um, so I know back then I had my massive uh, camera. It's about this size, my big Panasonic camcorder. Um, and I would have went out to the business and it would have been a really, really corporate style video. It would have been three minutes long. And I actually had um, like a proper body suit that the camera attached to. I had the worst back. I had like a weightlifting belt on because the camera was so heavy and everything was just so big and chunky and heavy. And I'm so glad that technology has got lighter and I am able to do this on my mobile phone because I really should show you the camera I'm referring to because it is massive um, and it is only 2K, whereas my mobile phone is 4K. So even now, the massive camera that I actually do show to children sometimes at primary school just to give them an idea of how far technology has come. Um, and I know a lot of videographers don't want to tell people that secret, but that is the truth. <laughs> you know, your mobile phone is like top quality. And I think that everyone does not realize the quality of videos that you're all walking around in your pocket. Um, so I suppose that's the message that I'm always trying to tell people about is um, that everyone can be doing this themselves. And a lot of the time people will say to me, you know, oh, what do I need to buy? I'm like, you don't have to buy anything. Just take your phone out and prop it on a book and hit record, you know? And I think that's the message that I'm trying to get out there at the minute. Um, the other thing is videos are not corporate anymore. Like back then you were so robotic you were talking um interview style um you would have like your company name at the bottom and you'd be talking really really professionally um whereas now it's it's getting a lot more human a lot of people are just talking directly to the camera and um they're getting their point across in a minute rather than three minutes so everything is so much more fast paced and it's really really important um to know these apps if you're looking to explore video yourself. Um, so I'm actually gonna share the screen and show you um, some of the apps that I use. Uh, screen share. There we go. Um, so I'm gonna share my mobile phone here. So this here, can everyone see this okay? This is my yes. phone. Welcome to my personal privacy. <laughs> I've actually turned off all of my notification settings because I was like, that is the last thing you want to happen <laughs> in the middle of this. Um, right, so I'm actually gonna just uh, drag all of you across so I can see you. Right, there we go. Right, by the way, if I sneeze in the middle of this, I noticed that I sneezed a lot over the last, I had to mute myself there because the hay fever is killing me. I have this window open because I'm roasting <laughs> here. Um, so I'm going to go across here to um, some of the main apps that I could not live without. Um, it wasn't until lockdown that I really, really started depending on these apps because um, I'll show you over here. This is my uh, three screens that I use over here to do a lot of my editing. Um, so I do still do a lot of my editing on um, Premiere Elements, but in lockdown, I obviously couldn't take all of that back with me to my house. So I really, really started to get attached to these apps. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is Filmora Go, which is this one here. 
Um, I'll just click into it here. So Femora Go is one that I got really familiar with, uh, especially in lockdown. Um, and I almost forced myself to learn it off by heart because it was my main um, editing tool. Um, so I'm going to go into one of these videos. This is one that I did uh, quite recently. I've noticed that because out of handiness, I've just started using the apps instead of Elements now because it is so easy when you learn how to do it. <laughs> so for example, in this video here, this is just me talking away to the camera. So I'm just going to show you um, the main things that if any of you is um, looking to do your own videos, um, I noticed that I was doing a lot of webinars on video confidence because a lot of people want to do it, but they're really, really scared to take that first step. Um, so I know that <laughs> I can tell you all these tools. I can tell you how to edit and tell you how to film, but really it's kind of the confidence has to come from you to go and do it. Um, so first of all, if you can see along the bottom here, you've loads of different examples or options here of trimming your videos and putting them together. So the thing that I find really handy about this is 80% of the most engaging videos on the internet right now are square. Um, and as you can see, I have cropped this into square. So it's the little canvas button at the bottom that has you choose what you want it to be in. Um, so you can have it in landscape. Um, I always put it in a portrait for the likes of Instagram and stories and IGTV. Um, but square is the one I would recommend for everyone to use. And this is the silliest reason ever, but the reason that square is so engaging is because when people are scrolling on their phones, they don't have to turn their phone sideways. And just that tiny hand movement has people watch less videos in any other format. Um, so I would recommend Square. I notice myself, if I have it in Square, it gets so much more engagement. So the reason that I love this um, app and what we're talking about today with no code is it is so good for the likes of text. Now, I know putting text into videos uh, six years ago, a lot of the time I would have had to have downloaded the text. Um, embedded the text into the video. If I was using After Effects, there was a lot of different things I had to do to animate the text. Um, whereas, in a way, this kind of sickens me how easy this is because it was so hard a couple of years ago to do this. Um, so the little text button here, it literally gives you the options um, that I can type in anything I want. So say if I type in text and then I type in Hey, so I have the word hey here. I can put this anywhere in the screen. Um, so I'll put hey up here. Um, and the thing that I love about this is, uh, oh, hold on, where'd it go? Um, you can change the font color to whatever color you want. You can change the font type. There's loads of different font types. Uh, these apps are getting better and better every year. They're given way more font options. So say if I make the font bold. Um, the other thing that I find brilliant about this app, which is something that a lot of apps don't have, is the border option. Borders are so important, especially if you're putting it on top of uh, a moving video. You have to be able to see the text. So what I usually do is I'll make the border just that little bit bigger so that you can see it. Um, and it gives you so many other options. You can use shadows, you can have animation, you can have the text flying in in the middle of you talking. Um, and this app's so easy for deciding whereabouts you want to actually put the text. Um, so yeah, this is really, really good for putting in um, the person's name or the subject matter. So if you can see, I'm talking about video confidence here. Stop this is me giving off about people comparing themselves to other people. <laughs> um, and then it's good because it means that when you're talking about a certain subject, you can put exactly what you're talking about at the bottom. I usually talk about tips and then I have tip one at the bottom, tip two at the bottom. Um, and it has options of filters. It has options of music. Um, and the other thing that is really good about this is a lot of people will say to me, you know, when I'm hitting record, my finger goes up and, you know, how do I cut that out? Um, so this is really good for, if you have a mistake, you can hit split and you can just delete it. Or the other option you can do is you can just pull this in and cut out the part that you don't want.
Now, I know I'm running through this as fast as I can, but um, it's just to show you everything that this app is capable of. Um, <laughs> any videos I have done over the last year has been using some sort of app, but this is definitely my favorite one at the moment. Um, now, as you can see, there's loads of different apps you can use out there. InShot's another one that's really good. It's quite similar. InShot is good for um, Instagram purely because um, I prefer it. This is a, a video I did of which character I was picking in lockdown. <laughs> so this is me picking my lockdown character. Um, now, this video I had filmed a portrait because it is a TikTok. So when I wanted to put it into Square, I was able to go to the canvas and it meant that I like that it puts like two blurred images at either side. So it means that it is still square. It still reads as square. Um, and you're still going to get the reaches if it's square, even though it's a portrait video within a square frame. So this is why framing is, is a lot more important than people think. Um, with this one, you can still add text. You can add filters. Um, and you can add in loads of different things. Um, I think the more text and the more things you have within a video, the more engaging it's going to be. Um, and the more likely people are going to stay and watch to see what you're talking about. Let's just start that. Um, and the last one that I want to talk about real quick is um, cinema graphs. Now, cinema graphs are something that are really quite new. Um, and the reason that I think they're really, really engaging and catch people's attention is because they haven't been used much recently. Um, and a cinema graph is a photograph where an image is moving within the photograph and it really does grab people's attention um, because people are not familiar with them. So uh, what I'm actually going to do just to show you, I'm actually going to take a photograph. There you all are. I'm actually going to take a photograph out this window just to show you. Okay. And what I'm going to do with this photograph is I'm going to put it into this app called Pixeloop, which is this middle one here, Pixeloop. Um, and this is a cinemagraph app, which means that I'll be able to move elements of this picture, um, but still keep it a photograph. Um, and this is something that is absolutely um, mind blowing for anyone who has ever tried to create any sort of animation. Um, this is something that's amazing that this does this so quickly. So I'm actually going to go in here, take this photograph. Right. So as you can see along the bottom, it means that uh, I could animate any part of this. Um, I can add sky effects. I can have overlays. I can have bubbles. I can add rain. Uh, the one I'm going to do today is just sky, just to show you. So I can make this a really stormy day. And I can actually change the um, clouds. There we go, looking real dark. Right, so I could literally send that to someone now and they would think that it's a really stormy day outside. Um, and it's really impressive if you can get someone in the photograph because it looks like the sky is just moving by itself. Um, or I can have it like a nice summer's day as well. So that's just an example with the sky. Um, another one is you can move water. So in this here one, I actually have the water moving and the sky moving, even though it is an image. Um, so this is just um cinema graphs uh, i'll get this coffee cup one here real quick just to show you it um so if i go over to elements um there is a little coffee cup element here that i can pop in here this one's really good for if you have uh, if you are putting up a post saying does anyone want coffee with me um i find that this grabs people's attention a lot because people will say to me like how did you have that coffee spinning for a minute straight um, I even had a woman say to me that she tried to recreate it. She didn't realize it was an app. She was spinning her coffee and filming and spinning her coffee. And she was like, how did you do this? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is just an example of a cinemagraph, which you still save in a video format. Um, and you're able to actually embed that into uh, your post. And it does get a lot of reach. Um, so I think that's all I'm going to cover today, just because I feel like if I cover too many apps, it's going to fry people's brains um, and hopefully you have a lot of questions at the end that I'll be able to go into a bit more detail but I feel like I don't want to go into too much detail <laughs> just in case it's, it's like overload. That was awesome, that was awesome Nave. Thank you very much. No problem.
I'm just going to have to, uh, let me see, pass over. Do you want me to pass the host back to you? Yep. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Cool. There we go. Similar sort of question, Ali. Like, what, out of all your video apps, like, what would be your just general favorite or most um, most valuable video app that you have? Would you just want to show it there or anything in particular? Yeah, so I kind of use Filmorgo a lot recently because I really do like the text. Um, I like the fact you can put a border on the text. I like the fact that it gives me a range of fonts. Um, that's the one I'm most familiar with at the moment. Um, like in a month's time, I could be obsessed with InShot because I like the filters or I like something to do with it. Um, there's another one quick that I use, Q-U-I-K. Um, it's a really quick uh, editing app that all you have to do is throw the footage into and it'll do it for you. Um, it's for anyone who doesn't want to actually go to the hassle of editing a video. The quick one's really good as well. Um, I suppose it depends on my mood. I have like a ridiculous amount of apps. <laughs> um, but yeah, or then some days I just want to sit at my computer and edit it on elements. But a lot of the time recently, it has been just using apps out of handiness, really. Um, do they work with all video file types? Yeah, so it's just um, any apps that I've shown you here is with any sort of phone. I don't like being biased when it comes to phones, so you can use it on um, Android. Apple phones um, and when you film it on your phone you just put it straight into the app directly from your phone album and I think the other thing because I know someone's probably going to ask you this how do you get uh, footage from your computer onto your phone um, you can whatsapp it whatsapp web's really good for I usually I, wa I whatsapp my sister like a ton of footage on whatsapp web and then I just save it on whatsapp she's torturing me yeah, that's, that's a great tip. I actually use that all the time for WhatsApp. The, the other sort of productivity thing with WhatsApp is like, which you didn't realize if you click on info whenever you're in a, in a group chat, you can actually uh, click on info and then click on links and click on media and then see to see all the links that have been posted in the chat room. So it yeah. means you can just browse all your videos and links all from one group chat, which is a great feature. But uh, see, Fajar has landed in. Hey, Fajar, man, how are you going? I'm going to. I, I'll, I'll do my talk now and then I'll actually make uh, Fajar go last because he's joining us so late. But um, he's uh, awesome to have us here. Fajar is it's very, it's very early in the morning. Fajar, right now, I think he's about two in the morning or something. Or what? Un unmute yourself and say hello, man. Hey, what's up, guys? How's it going? Hello from Singapore. Hi. <laughs> so, technically, Fajar's our keynote, keynote, keynote speaker tonight because he's. VIP all the way from Singapore, so very, very privileged to have him here. But uh, I'll, I'll kick off now, and then uh, you 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 create a good ask for yours. Is that cool? Yeah, it's, it's cool. You you can start. Here it is. Um, I will start. So let me choose. Okay, folks, can everyone see my screen now? Yeah. Everyone's the uh, Safari open, not, not yep. my whole desktop. Cool. Okay, so I wanted to, this, 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 this whole sort of talk that I'm talking about is going to be focused around no code and um, startups and the maker scene and touching a bit on community. And uh, Whenever you think about startups and the maker community, there's one guy who always comes to my head, and it's this guy called Peter Levels. And he started this, um, he sort of started the, the 12 and 12 project thing that was going on for a while where people would do a monthly project every single um, every single month and the reason why he did this because he thought as a creative and um, he realized that creatives are like um, they're really good at starting stuff and they love starting stuff and they have all this energy but they're not very good at finishing stuff so as a creative he thought he would challenge himself to do 12 projects in, in 12 months and he decided to call it um, 12 projects or tw 12 startups in 12 months and he got a bit of flack for it but uh, what he did was he launched 12 apps in 12 months, and one of those apps was called Nomad List, and that's generating 20k a month now. So it's, uh, it's, it's doing quite well. But that's not the main reason why I wanted to talk about Peter. Um, one of the one, main reasons I want to talk about him is because he came up with this quote last year, and he said, in the future, writing actual code will be like a pro DSLR camera, and no code will be like using a smartphone camera. So what he was saying is like, if you think about how people use uh, smartphones today and how you can sort of become a photographer or a videographer 
and uh, you can use like the tools like Neves just showed us there. Um, you can actually make really professional stuff really fast and re really, really easy with um, sort of uh, a, a bit of training, a bit of knowledge on how to use your phone. So what Peter was saying is like, if you want to get into no code in a couple, within a couple of years, you're going to be able to do it. Like people use digital SLRs, but with a smartphone, just to sort of showcase that sort of thing. Um, if you look what Apple posted, like sh shot on your iPhone, like all the, these photos are actually shot on an iPhone. And like, they just look like, if you could say to someone like 10, 20 years ago, probably even five years ago, or even now, like, like that these phones, photos were shot on a, on a phone, like they're absolutely amazing. So that sort of showcases like the what you can do on a phone. So if you can imagine that concept where if you are building websites on a phone and they are at the quality of like Apple photography or phone photography, that's what we're going to be at for the next couple of years. But uh, one of the other things Peter touched on was um, whenever you think, you think about SLRs, you think about the complexity inside the device and all the accessories it has and the lenses and the battery pack and the microphone and everything. What these things are are actually like, um, if you look, compare them to software, you compare them to websites, um, it's actually like gluing things together. So whenever you think of a, whenever you think of a website, essentially a website is just an input and output system. So essentially a website, not to get too technical, is it's an API. So a web app, what it's doing is like taking, if you were to look at the example of the digital SLR, basically, if you think of before that person clicks the button to take a photograph and um, the, the cameras being there, the electronics being there, all the, the battery pack and the microphone, that all is like being magically glued together and instantly you're hitting the button. I couldn't, I couldn't, couldn't find a photograph of that. So I found this analogy of what is an ABI where a user is going up to a barista and the barista is magically making everything from the kitchen and uh, they're getting their coffee at the end. Um, so that in a nutshell is very fast overview of like, what a web app is and what um, the future of, of no coding can be. But that's, before I, I want to get you to understand the sort of concept, and the more the, the concept is about how Peter talked about um, this 12 and 12 startups thing. What he did was he wanted people to build startups fast. And it, to think about how some people are building startups right now um, fast is, is through using no code apps. And these might even be the no code apps that you're thinking of. At the end of the talk, I'm going to show you some no-code apps that are trendy right now that you can build really complex stuff with. But I want to just break in by showing like some simple ways of doing no-code online. Instagram is a perfect tool. Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, these are all tools that you use that are no-code. You can jump in, you can create a page, you can start building your brand, you can start um, building a business straight away. And uh, this is a, a startup by uh, a woman who lives out in Balamina direction or Port, Port Rush, I'm not quite sure. But uh, she has, has an Instagram page and this is how she sells her business. So she will just have a very simple thing where the user can come on and they will have, they have four options, choose the fabric, choose the, the material and send her the money essentially. And she has like Instagram stories to show it, showcases the product really well, shows the back fabric and um, prototypes what she does. And she also has like uh, testimonials. So this is like, it's, it's, at the end of the day, this is like a, a website and a product that you can come on and buy something as a service. And it's built in the, the Instagram ecosystem. So not only are you building your product um, with no code, but you're building it on top of an ecosystem that has millions and millions of users. So that, that concept shows that like no code is a really fast way to build product and you can actually build so fast and start executing straight away. Um, so this is not, another example just shows that, it's, that this is the web version of Instagram. You can actually browse on the website live, or you can actually obviously use the, the, the web app straight away. And um, so that, the other example was, um, so I've lost one of my slides, but the, the other example I was gonna show you was um, a baker that, I, that I've i sort of found on, on Instagram. And how he operates is he um, uses WhatsApp as a way of selling stuff. So he will open up WhatsApp and he will use a broadcast message. So he anyone that has his number saved on their phone, whenever he, post a message saying, um, I have new bread in as a broadcast. Everyone gets a broadcast message saying, this baker has new bread. So again, that's another effective way where um, you can you know, start a business straight away with no, uh, just using WhatsApp. Uh, what has this got to do with um, APIs that I was talking about before? During the pandemic and recently with like the Black Lives Matters campaign going on, 
a lot of people have started to put together these um, spreadsheets and essentially one of the things that I've noticed is like this is a really good way for people in 2020 to just start collecting data and um, what you can do with this this is all just uh, like created data that's been put together you can go in and browse it but what you can actually do is connect that to an API on your web app and you can essentially um, piece it all together to some sort of web app this is another example with like the, uh, the coronavirus tech handbook that um, again it's just all publicly brought together data and um, this is put together in notion and uh, people can just add to it and it, it's a growing database and um, there's my green, uh, there's my WhatsApp photos. So th this is how this guy on WhatsApp works. He, he, he'll basically post out a broadcast message. And again, this is a, a very, very simple version of a, I would call a minimum viable product. Like, uh, it's, it's, it's a way that he is demonstrating how he's able to make money. And it's, it's obviously working because he, um, he gets sold out regularly. So again, it's a website where the baker are, doesn't really need a big platform, but he could basically monitor and see that um, he is making sales and therefore he can put money in to maybe get an actual website built for him. Um, so again, what, what does this have to do about no code? Well, I'm gonna talk quickly about a project that I built during uh, the first sort of week of lockdown. And what I noticed was that all of these um, del delivery shops and shops in Northern Ireland started to uh, pivot to delivery services. So what I thought was like, oh, there's gonna be a, a need for like, uh, a, a place to sort of p put all this stuff together and we, we need to see who's uh, delivering Northern Ireland. So what I did, I say I put out an Airtable and then um, what that did was like that allowed people to collect data. So I posted this Airtable on my Facebook and people started to input information on who was delivering in Northern Ireland. And uh, I launched a, a fairly quick website. So the difference with this is this here is what I would call low code where um, I actually designed a website, but all, all the actual data was collected through a method of uh, just a Google contact form. So I just launched a Google contact form and people started putting the data in and I ended up with a spreadsheet um, full, of, full of data and it looked like this. So people just started putting in uh, cost cutter, it was a grocery service, put the link in and they were delivering and that would then populate to my website. Uh, live. So that was when um, I started taking that to the next stage, but where it would, I actually got a message from a guy called St Stephen Highlands on the Des NI Design Slack, and he had said that there's this Facebook group called Who's Deliver in Northern Ireland. So using the community, I just thought I would uh, message uh, this woman, Katrina Doran, who runs the, runs the community on Facebook. This community has over a thousand people on it, and they're just constantly updating the information every day. So this is Another example of how you're not using code, but you're getting all your data from somewhere. So what I just messaged Katrina and said, look, I'm building this website. Is there any chance you could share your data with me? And she did. She just sent me the CSV file with over 100, um, uh, over 100 like places on it. And what I'd done then is I, I, I turned it into my product. So this was my sort of MVP, where it was a, a website where you could just go in and browse and see who's delivering in your area. So um, for example, you could click on the Finyard, you would see that the Finyard is delivering and then you would click order and that actually goes through to their Facebook. And uh, so there's no actual mechanism to like take orders or anything. That's maybe the next stage, but what what I'm actually looking at next is maybe just doing reviews. And how I'm going to do that is by using a service called um, Typeform. Um, what Typeform does is it just, it's similar to Google Forms where you just input data and it then will display the data automatically. So I'm gonna show you an example of how to use Typeform very quickly. And I did that, or I'm gonna show you by uh, an idea that I had this week. So with Raise, we were, we were looking to create this survey that um, allows, we, we wanna start a, co a communication on startups in Northern Ireland. And what I decided to do was to create a no code website to sort of demonstrate how that's done. So this is the website that I, that I, that I built with no code. It's, it's a very simple website. So it's just like uh, nistartup.com has its own domain and says, are you involved in an Irish startup scene? We want to start this open discussion, blah, 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 has three buttons and one to send, show me the results. So if you hit the results button, this is like the data we've collected already. But uh, say you're just new and we, you want to start getting involved, 
you would click um, start the survey and then you're just starting to fill out this information um, and who you are, what sort of stage you're at, um, what sort of sector you're in, well, not biotech. Um, then we wanted to collect postcodes because we didn't want to collect too much sensitive data, but um, we wanted to maybe see where that person was. So we want to maybe like set a location on like a map to say there's so many startups in this area. We would then collect their email address and we would then see if you wanted to add their marketing. Everyone loves marketing, so why would you say no? And then you add your first names for personalization. Have you heard of any of these startup programs? Just some personal data that we want to like maybe collect ourselves. And then this is directly for raised so we can see like uh, what sort of business foundations would you like to hear about? So this sort of, again, is also being able to get information from the startups that are in Northern Ireland already and we can hear from them. So that's then submitted and brilliant. And I, then I, if I was to refresh this, then Invisible Building should be added to the show me the results. Yeah, so there I've been added. So basically anyone can now come in and add data to your website straight away. I'll show you quickly how this was set up because it's it's very easy. So it's set up using a website called card.co and card.co is a website by an indie maker called, I think his name's AJ, um, I'm not 100% sure his name, but it's very simple and it's very affordable. It, I think it's something like nine pound a year and you can get like three websites or something, $19 a year. And you, you get you get like a couple of websites you can build for free or for $19. And this is how it works. So if I click into one of my websites, I can, it loads up very fast. You can actually just click and drag and drop, drag and drop everything. So you could drag, move it about, um, change the name. Back. You know, it's very, very easy to use. And it, it'll just grow and grow and grow. To get the results for the website, we actually use another a no code tool called Airtable. It's, it's not really a no code tool, it's, it's a tool that uh, no coders have been using to sort of build websites. So, whenever you think back about APIs, what we're actually doing, we're, we're not using the API, but we're, we're actually just um, embedding this um, Airtable into, uh, into the website. But because it's embedded, it automatically updates whenever the type form is. So, the type form uses another third party called Sapier. So this is where it gets, starts to get complicated because with no code, you're maybe taking three or four, five or six, 10 different APIs or third party services that um, integrate. So what we're doing with nistartup.com is that we will, um, whenever someone starts a survey, they, on the wrong website, whenever someone starts a survey, they're presented with a type form. That type form then gets sent to this part of the website by going through Sapier, because Sapier is an automation tool. So it, what, what it does is the input, the data goes to type form, gets through Sapier, goes back to Airtable, and then Airtable then is embedded on the website. So it sort of is a very sort of micro web app straight away. The next stage of this app is to, um, got stuff like on that one. So the next stage of this app is to just sort of build on the startups here. So you can see we've got logos in. These three startups are logos that are on the RAISE program already. So they automatically got their logos added by me just to sort of promote them for the crack. Um, but these, the rest of them that have no logos have been user submitted. So um, the next stage is to email all these companies and just say, what's your logo? What's your description? Uh, what's your website? And then that's where, from there, we're gonna keep sort of the conversation going. But again, that will be done just through MailChimp, which is another third party. We'll then mail, email everyone an email. Uh, they will get the information and then it will automatically go through CAPR and upload it to the website. So this is another, this, so that's Airtable. And then from, so that, 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 that in a nutshell is like um, a sort of very quick, way to showcase how to build a prototype uh, with no code. And what you want to do to take it to the next level is to look at the likes of Bubble. Uh, Bubble is 
a no code tool that sort of tries to bring it all in one. So instead of having your, all your third parties, what Bubble does is it lets you um, sort of have like a drag and drop interface where you can click add text, add your maps. So where I built my Yoda, Yoda delivery app, I could have maybe done it in Bubble and instead of having to use the code, I could have had embedded maps. I could have had it, um, all the functionality that I wanted and I wouldn't have had to actually dabble with any code. And it sort of showcase like how, how, how good Bubble is. Bubble lets you, has, has given us these tutorials. So like how to build a Trello clone. So like if Ellie wanted to build her own Trello where it's like ellie.productivity.com or something, she could have her own version of that. Um, you could have your own product talent, you could have your own Google Calendar, like the list goes on. And literally Bubble are sort of giving you the tutorials so you could just jump in and start coding that straight away. Bubble's um, vision is to replace um, to, re to replace sort of the, the initial sort of process of building a web app. So they, they sort of want to be like the AWS um, so of, um, for startups for, for, for building web apps with no code. And what they will do is um, let you sort of set up your login system straight away, let you sort of build your sort of your initial storyboard. So what, what they want is like the marketers to maybe get in and start building the website and then the real sort of secrets are like focused on by the engineers because your, your engineers shouldn't be um, mucking about by like building sign up forms. Like a sign up form should be automated like um, from the start. So if you, if, you, if you wanted to get into no code, I would start by having to look at car and building a very simple website like I did. Um, and then to take it up a notch, you, you want to look up like sort of no code, no code api.com, which is like a service where you can um, pay a bit of money and try out some sort of easy tools. I think it's quite, there you go, it's unlimited for certain things. You can start by like building a Google Sheet with an API and stuff like that. So I think that is me finished up and I'm gonna to start to pass on to Fajar. So Fajar, I'm gonna make you the host now. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. So I, I will, I'll introduce Fajar while he's setting up. So Fajar is a, he's a lot of things, I guess. He is a, a no code, or he, he's an indie maker, uh, influencer more than anything. He, he lives out in Fajar, or he lives out in Singapore. He, live, he, he has been working on the web for over 10 years. He started as a freelancer and um, has sort of been building his way up. I met Fajar um, through a really cool community called MakerDog. And it's, if anyone who wants to get into sort of this sort of community thing, I would recommend joining MakerDog. Like it's getmakerlog.com. It's a, it's a really, really, really cool platform. And um, you'll, you'll see the likes of Vajar and what he does every day. But um, on top of everything, Vajar is actually also a pretty spectacular yo-yo player. So I don't know if he's mm -hmm. going to talk to us all about yo-yoing, but um, mm -hmm. I'll, let him, I'll let him kick off with this talk now. And uh, right. thanks very much, Vajar. Very lucky to have you. Thank you for having me, David, and uh, Race Ventures. And hello, everyone from Singapore. And uh, so I'll share my screen right now, okay? Come so uh, I'll introduce myself again, <laughs> maybe. My name is Fajr Siddiq. Uh, been doing this like uh, 30, uh, like 10 years. Okay, so I'm gonna share this uh, on the desktop, right? Okay, wait, share the screen. Oh no, wait. Just a minute. Can you hear me? All right, here we go. See you, man. Awesome. Awesome. Can you hear me loud and clear? Right. So this is my presentation. Then I prepare a slide, uh, just using a PowerPoint. So I'm still an entrepreneur in the maker, influencer, producer, professional player for more than 20 years. Been playing yo-yo uh, at a digital nomad. Something got to do with my lifestyle thingy, travel and work and a designer and a developer myself. So basically it's just me, my laptop, paying bills and buy me coffee. So the topic today is tech for non-tech. Thank you, uh, Race Ventures for putting this together. 
So building automation, committee and no code. So first of all, I would like to share with you about Jamstack. If any one of you know about Jamstack, so Jamstack is JavaScript, APIs and uh, markup. So um, I really like uh, one thing about Jamstack is that I use uh, one of these hosting services called Netlify.com. So you can uh, put this together uh, via the GitHub and create a redirect. And you can put whatever uh, slash, whatever uh, names or short URL link to share easily. And you can do that uh, really quickly without building any website pages because building website pages takes time. So next I'm gonna go to growing your audience. So I built this uh, very friendly uh, community on Telegram. Uh, it's a diversity group, uh, people from all different sorts of background, uh, religious background, uh, different race, and it's everywhere part of the world. And um, it's really great to see everybody shipping and launching, helping them to actually uh, to start their side projects and build their MVPs and also launch and also earning their first dollar. So next, I will share you more about open startups, sharing metrics and stories. So this is a very cool uh, software or website that I use. Uh, it's by Simple Analytics. So it's basically, uh, it's privacy friendly and data is always encrypted and you can always uh, see, you know, how many views do you get? And you can share this uh, publicly online instead of using uh, Google Analytics or maybe like the Tom. So next we'll share you more about uh, tipping, tipping culture. You know, we as creators or makers, or, you know, sometimes we don't do like a full-time work or like maybe we don't uh, do something. We, we want to do something that's small. So we want to help each other to grow. Sometimes, you know, we have this culture. I don't know about uh, people in Europe or in Ireland do they give like tipping, like, you know, buy a coffee for somebody else. But this is uh, putting everything online digitally. So uh, it's similar something like Patreon, but this, uh, it, it works with Stripe and PayPal as well. So it shares uh, your earnings, your visitors, your supporters. So you can go to buymecoffee.com for this one. And it's really useful. So I use this for tipping, tipping culture. And then uh, there's a website called Indie Hackers where you can actually share your, a Stripe revenue. So this is how actually I grow uh, from my tipping culture of what I'm doing. So hitting my revenue for monthly recurring. And this, uh, this data was verified by Stripe. You can just go on IndieHackers.com, create a profile and uh, add your product and as well as um, your uh, Stripe if you want to share. So this is more about open startup. The next is uh, I think David chair with you about make a lot. So shipping in public. I think the culture here is about shipping public. Like, you know, a lot of people share a lot of stuff, what they do. So usually they share on like uh, Instagram stories or Facebook, like, hey, I'm gonna build this, I'm gonna build that. So probably there's some other task that you wanna do, which is more smaller and more micro, but it's public, but it's being shared by the like-minded people. So that this community is called Make A Lock. And most of them are developers, but uh, as soon as uh, Make A Lock has grown since year 2018, uh, there's a lot of uh, different background join this community. Uh, people who wants to learn how to code, people who knows about no code, people who are doing video content, people who are probably just a new founder or someone who just uh, learning perhaps. So they lock their tests and everybody can see their tests and you can praise them and comment and so on and so forth. So next is like, uh, I'm, I'm gonna share you more about using uh, make a lock but with the web hooks. So with, on the github.com itself, you can actually upload uh, uh, the web hooks, not upload, uh, what I mean is uh, just add the web hook. So how do you add that? Is just create a, like a product on make a lock and then you can just, uh, these are some of the products that I'm working on right now, it's on progress. And some of it is like my company and some of it is like my micro startups, which means a side project. And then uh, this is the uh, integration of the webhook. So each time uh, I deploy, uh, I update my GitHub, I commit something on github.com. So the task will automatically lock uh, on the make a lock. So you can either lock your task from Telegram or from the GitHub itself. Okay. So this is more about automation stuff. 
So next, I'm going to share you more about product launching. I think everybody knows what's Product Hunt. It's really interesting. So I started, I started join Product Hunt uh, as a community member, uh, just a user, you know, like uh, in 2016, but I didn't really use it because I think uh, it's just like people publish some website or some apps. But after a while, uh, in 2018, I got started to be active. And uh, in 2019, I became one of the, I was selected. I got an email from Ryan Hoover. And they actually, uh, you know, they wanted me to be the influencer for founder.club, which is by Product Hunt. And you actually can uh, use my domain, I mean, this link, fajacity.com slash founder club to get a 50% off first year. There's so many stuff, like uh, a lot of things you can get uh, really cheap like the softwares and so much stuff. You can just go to, to the link that I give you. You can fill up the form. So you get 50% off first year. So this is a, the, 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 the influencer thingy. And then next is just this digital nomad lifestyle. I've been uh, traveling uh, and working remotely with just my laptop, with just a Wi-Fi, and just somewhere, you know, a nice place to just have a mango juice or probably a coffee, working in Starbucks, uh, working somewhere with Wi-Fi in public. So this is like more of a culture thing where, uh, you know, in the future is like of remote working is here. So a lot of people, they want to have like work life balance because they want to balance their mental health. You know, they want to, they, they want to have like meeting other people, uh, people from different parts of the world and they want to travel and see nature as well. So this is a very good place. Uh, you can sign up, uh, made by Peter Levels uh, and as well as uh, he's my close friend as well. So you can just sign up here and uh, you can uh, basically put uh, the, explore the places, like which is the best spots that you want to go and best for nomading. So you can check out nomadlist.com. So I've been nomading about 10 years, but due to the COVID-19, uh, you know, I'm just back at home or going to the groceries. <laughs> so next, uh, next is meeting all these uh, makers, founders, and digital nomads in real life. So I, I, make, I like to make videos, like uh, just blog, and also uh, uh, product launches video as well. You can go to my YouTube channel, there's a whole like, bunch of playlists that I make. So, uh, so this is my first time meeting all these people that I never met before, and they, 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 were, in, uh, they were on Twitter. So they were on Twitter and then we kind of like chat and then go on Telegram and then we meet in real life and we kind of like ship together, we launch together and they run their own stuff, they run their own uh, side projects. Some of them already have company. So there's a few videos. So meeting in real life uh, is really great. And then next, uh, produce your own content. So I think it's really important for us to not just rely on some other media or local newspaper or somebody to write about you. I think it's really important for us as a, like uh, indie makers we kind of like write our own blog. So I, I'm, not, I'm not really good at writing blog, but um, maybe I just blog like probably uh, one year, probably like, I don't know, three, five times. Uh, I just started my podcast and it's on my fourth episode. And I did a lot of launches videos you can see here. So uh, this uh, launches videos like 30 seconds and I edit videos. And most of the videos helps uh, people to uh, get a lot of leads. Uh, it is good for advertising. Uh, so they share these videos. Uh, I can share with you the link if you want me to share with you. And then next, uh, you know, feature articles. So I was featured on the code, code.org for making a no-code game called supermakers.xyz. So you can build games with no code as well. And it's good for like, uh, you know, uh, people who wants to get into the tech or, you know, if you want uh, someone who is young, you know, they can start with games and then they go to coding and probably go to the business and so on and so forth. Everything you got to start from young. So uh, I was also featured on uh, makermag.com uh, and I was the judge spotlight for this uh, fixathon.io. It was like uh, for this fix the climate, fix the climate uh, for a cause. Later on, I will share you more about that. So uh, I also built communities offline and online. So for this one, uh, I built community uh, offline. So we have like a more than about 200 people. So this is actually my second company. So we started our startup just selling t-shirts and then uh, we have just this uh, uh, very simple uh, niche where we focus on uh, youth and uh, skill toys as well as um, like a uh, lifestyle culture. So a lot of kids, you know, they like play yo-yos, skateboarding, uh, cycling, you know, all these hobbies kind of stuff. So I, I built this and you can see all the videos in there. And uh, I sell t-shirts as well. 
and uh, we sold over a thousand of t-shirts and uh, currently uh, we are not producing because uh, t-shirts are sold out so probably I will you know make a new batch or something so I've been running this and also building a community on telegram it's so easy we can just uh, sign up telegram uh, you know just add some like-minded people to discuss certain topics so uh, this is an online uh, telegram community and we can build I, I built gemstatmakers.com and as well as open podcast so with the people that I've never met in my life including David so we met online and we kind of just like uh, chat with the people around there and next is uh, this, this is the one that I did for the hackathon which is the being the judge so uh, it's for a good cause so we want to save the earth I guess yeah so next uh, the future of no code is here so I guess you guys probably know uh, I think Amazon recently came out with uh, no code. So the big companies, the big players also as well, uh, you know, is doing no code. So you can uh, click on the link there, honeycode.aws. So there's a like, templates and pricing you can check out. And next, uh, I have this whole bunch of these uh, links. So uh, at the bottom here, there's like, three links, these three bottom links. You can actually sell your site projects. You know, you can sell it at probably like $1,000, $5,000, $10,000. So you, maybe you want to start a startup, maybe you want to build a company. But some people, they want to build a side project and then uh, they just want to like sell it away. So I had a friend named Danish. Um, I, I kind of like helped him from the start and he was building like uh, his nine project. It was called No Code API that David showed a while ago. So I kind of like helped him and he sold his project for $22,000 and it was amazing. And now he built he used the money to travel and pay his bills and travel and uh, just uh, you know build his next project which is no code api so it's very important just not to just build projects you need you need to know where you're going so like uh, it's either you want to you know sell it or maybe you just want to earn it from there whichever it is and the rest of this uh, you can i can share with you about statbit so statbit is like a gem stack for no code it's really great you just click 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 and the website is done and you just fill up the content and that's it. I really like Jamstack because it's fast and it's secure and it's very useful for privacy as well. So next, uh, I have a whole bunch of uh, like a list of no code tools. If you want, I have uh, gathered this uh, link and together inside here, this whole bunch, you just click and everything is in there in the add table. And of course, uh, some article links reference for like uh, talking about open startups uh, and the second link was uh, talking about my uh, first company that I built which is a digital agency and how I actually run a small studio and as well as uh, make a Mac which is normal and thank you so much uh, this uh, for more you can just go uh, for my slides at fragacidic.com slash raise benches right You hear me? Awesome, Jar. Yeah, awesome, Jar. Thank, Thank you very if, much. If, if you guys have any question, do ask me or leave a, like a chat or something. Or if not, you can ask me later on Twitter. So I hope uh, I can bring a benefit or share some knowledge. If you need some help or anything, hopefully I can share something useful. Awesome, dude. Do you want to make me the host there, and then I'll ask you a few questions that we've got here already Just while, yeah. we're, while we're waiting. <laughs> So um, one of the things that um, Jenny, one of the, the founders of Raze actually commented on was that you sent over your slide deck, like you said, and it was fajarslidec.com oh. forward slash Raze Ventures. I know you touched on that on the top at the start. Like, uh, could you give us a quick overview and sort of how you set that up? Was that done through no code or was that done through GitHub or what was the process of doing that? Which one? Uh, whenever where you were able to do your redirect, so you're able to set up a redirect with uh, so your VHRC like yeah. com goes to yeah. So okay, you want to see now like live? Well, whatever you want. If, if all right, if you let's show go. Us. Let's do this. Okay, so wait, let me just uh, switch on this Google Chrome for a while. Just a minute. Uh, let me just go to race benches. Minute, let me just share my screen real quick. Uh, wait, okay, okay, here you go. So, okay, right now, wait, what's the Race Benches website? 
Okay. For example, I want to share this link, right? Can you see my screen now? You can, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so let's say I want to go to this uh, this link, but this you know you see this link this short URL is really long up here, right? It's really long. So what I do is just I make a I just cut that link and I go to my GitHub repository the the website and I just create a file here called underscore redirects. Okay, just click that one. And what I do next is uh, just a minute, and I click this one. And I will just edit this file and just scroll down and just go down here. And uh, I just put uh, uh, race ventures event. Okay, just copy paste and you just like have a space in between here. And that's it, done. And what you need to do next is just make the comic changes. Okay, so. You need to go to Netlify because I'm using Netlify to uh, post this my website. My website. Let me just uh, do this real quick. So I just click here and just clear catch and uh, deploy. So let it load for a while. The Netlify is working on. Just a minute, probably the internet. What it's doing is actually quite fast. There you go, it's done already. <laughs> right. Yeah, because I, I have uh, some other stuff here. Okay, once it's done, they will just say the site is live. So what you need to do now is just go to any like empty, you know, just right here at the top part here and just put the uh, race, ventures, event, right? So you want to share this link to everybody on the internet, but at any press enter, and boom, and it goes to raise venture events. See, you can awesome. do this as a short URL and you can redirect as many, uh, whatever you want. So I think it's really useful, you know, because people doesn't want to see like bit.ly or some short URL company. I don't want to have those brand. I want my own domain brand, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So if you have any questions, please uh, ask me, yeah. Cool. Um, by the way, everyone, feel free to unmute your mics and jump in and ask questions. Yeah, just directly jump in, want. just like but, switch on the mics and probably ask me some questions. Oh, you want to see but, me play yo-yo? Uh, <laughs> of course, yeah, we definitely want to see you play yo-yo. <laughs> yeah, show us. Okay, some. okay, I'm just gonna show you real quick. So this is one A. Eh? That's almost, that's almost faster than uh, the Netlify upload. Okay, wait, there's another one. Real quick, this is off string. You see, the yo-yo is not attached to the string. It's like no code, you know? Yeah. So, Fajar, how did, you, how, how did you get in? The yo-yo was, was yo-yo big in Singapore, or did you just jump into it? Uh, through, uh, you know, it's always the media. It's always the TV. I always watch uh, TV. So they always have these commercials. So I go to the toy department store and just buy a yo-yo. So I was just that little kid, 12 years old, just going up and down. And then I got it really serious. I started to uh, play and compete. And then after that, I joined yo-yo contest. And then after that, at the age of 14 years old, I got sponsored by Duncan Toys, one of the top uh, skill toy company in the world. Um, they are a very huge company. They are everywhere in the part of the world. Duncan Toys, you can just go to the website, yo-yo.com. And I've been sponsored for 14 years and I've been playing yo-yo for 20 years. And I travel to other countries uh, to judge and also manage a community. So this is something for my hobby. And how do I get paid? Is uh, basically I do shows and pretty much about it. Do you, do you think you got into like community by being in the yo-yo community? Is that how you sort of transferred from learning your learning as part of that sort of like in Northern Ireland here we have quite quite a good sort of uh, indie rock scene or like uh, yeah. rock and roll scene. Was, so like like my yeah. experience through like learning learn, learn about campaigns and social media was through like um, that type of thing. So, so uh, pretty much uh, I started out with uh, this community called MySpace.com. 
So there was this whole bunch of uh, indie creators and music, people share music. So I was like joining the forum and discussion. And the next thing I went for a meetup in the town area part of Singapore. And there was like people in the band, people playing punk rock music, hardcore metal, and then uh, people playing some, uh, some other songs. And then I got into like uh, doing silkscreen printing t-shirt. That's how I got started with uh, graphic design. And then from there, uh, I was very much involved with like socialize myself. So I learned about community. And then uh, from there, uh, it just go naturally. So you just kind of like join and then you just like mix around yourself and ask questions. I think it's very important to ask questions and always to learn from other people as quickly as possible and see and also make a lot of mistakes because I've done so many mistakes in uh, whatever I do. So you just uh, practice to perfect, I guess. Yeah. I've got a question here for Ellie. Like, uh, Ellie, what is the best way to hire a VA or virtual assistant? So I actually used to, I'm going to pop it into the chat here. Um, I used to have a free resource on my website about this back when I was advertising VA services. So I'm just going to give that to everyone here. But my number one recommendation is to get a referral because if you're getting a referral from about a VA that you like know, you know, from somebody else, you're going to trust and know that that VA is going to do a better job for you than if you're just picking somebody on off Fiverr or Upwork or something. That said, I got my VA off of work. He's amazing. Um, <laughs> so uh, popping that file in now. And then I saw, mm, 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 sorry. Um, well, it didn't let me click and drag it. So I'm having to go through the like the longer route, oh. but it should be there for everyone. Uh, we got it now. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, there was a question I saw for Neve here, I think. Uh, so any advice for startups recording virtual pitches? Hmm. Pitches are a bit different. Um, is it like pitching to... So like, um, so one of the, one of the things we, like, for example, we did last week, we organized an event called the Remote Raise where we had um, about eight startups, I think, pitching um, at, at the one time, and they would just sort of pitch for investment. So basically, they would have a slide deck, and traditionally, it would be done on a stage. Who you, the startup uh, founder would be on the stage, yeah. they would have their PowerPoint behind them, and they would sort of say, This is my startup, I want this much equity, and please give me your money, essentially. And uh, yeah. now it's sort of been put through to like uh, a, digital, a digital version. So, like, I guess there's sort of any advice on how to record video. From a, as a startup, from a startup's perspective? I would say um, as short as possible. It's always as short as par possible. That's always my advice when it comes to um, keeping the person's engagement. Um, I know that when it comes to, you know, like a five minute pitch, um, I know if someone comes to me and they say they want a video and they'll tell me their pitch, I have to try and make that under a minute and a half. Um, so I always find that if they can do it as quick as possible, I always say like have an introduction and then three tips and then an outro. Like that's how I do all my videos. Um, so I would say if they can introduce themselves a bit about what they're going to be talking about and then three main tips about what they're talking about and then an outro saying thanks for listening. Um, that's how I structure all my videos. What about sort of a confidence on camera? Yeah. Have you any advice on just how, is it just go for it? Or do you have any advice on like <laughs> things to try and do? There's a few pointers. Like I know um, my first, like I used to do videos when I was younger and I just lost my confidence. <laughs> like the longer you leave it, like if I didn't make a video now for six months, my confidence would go again. Um, I yeah. find that there is a few tips. Like I would say, um, yeah, practice, 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 show your family and friends, um, get some feedback off them before you upload it. Um, and then I would say as long as you're confident with your content, that's where the confidence comes from. Um, so as long as you are talking comfortably, comfortably about your subject matter, then the confidence will just come out because you're talking about something that you're comfortable with. Um, I think a lot of people are scared it's just knowing that you're nobody is scared of the camera. Nobody is scared of the camera. You're scared of how you're going to be perceived on the other end of the camera. 
Um, so I think once you face that, um, because a lot of people always say they're scared of cameras, but you're not scared of the actual mm -hmm. camera itself. <laughs> like you're scared of people, yeah. you know, like you're, I, I, I always just say to people, no, you're scared of people. So I would say if you can just face up to what you're scared of the people thinking, um, and then just don't care. <laughs> I think I'm at a stage where, um, but at the same time, if you're comfortable with the platform, like I'm comfortable with LinkedIn because um, I have barely any family or friends on it. Like if, you, if I yeah, took yeah. the same videos and put them on Facebook, I would be extremely uncomfortable. Um, yeah, that's a, that certainly leads me on to questions I was going to ask you as well, just from my own my own perspective. Like, uh, what is it about LinkedIn that you like? Is it because you sort of, or you're just a more professional version of yourself that's you're uh, doing, or is is there something magical there that we're? Yeah, we're there there. is something magical there. <laughs> it is like um, they always talk about LinkedIn family, but it's really strange. I do feel like I have built up like a lot of brothers and sisters, a lot of parents, a lot of cousins you know like I feel like everyone talks to me like they're related to me like it's so friendly it's so supportive um the likes of TikTok they just want to destroy you they want you to feel as terrible yeah. as you possibly can <laughs> um but I just feel like it's a very encouraging platform they're all there to help you they're all there to support you and if you're open and honest on the platform and say it's your first time they will just love you to pieces um it's definitely a brilliant platform to start with. What do you think about using a, a teleprompter? Because I know that there are a couple of apps for recording yeah. videos, like say for pictures or whatever, that will allow you to have a script written and use a teleprompter while you're recording. So you're not you're able to maintain eye contact with the camera itself. Yeah. Um, I know I have a teleprompter. I haven't used it in about three years. Um, I used to bring it with me. I used to do the First Trust Bank videos. Um, they're in-house training videos. Any training videos, um, the companies would, you know, let me take my teleprompter with me. Um, I don't like them anymore because I just feel like people forget to blink. And blinking is what makes you look human. Um, and if you're not blinking and you're talking like this here and you're reading, it just, <laughs> it looks really crazy. Like, um, and I think it, it takes, it takes a lot of practice to be able to talk a teleprompter and sound like a human being. Um, so I always say when it comes to scripts, like, again, don't memorize it. Like just try and think of bullet points and try to talk, um, to the camera as if you're talking to a human. Um, I try to think of one person that's going to see the video and talk to the camera lens as if you're talking to that person. Um, or you can try the teleprompter and just really try and, um, you know, rewatch it and try and train yourself to sound human. Um, it's very hard though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks. There's a, there's a question here from Jonah. I'm just going to merge them two together. Thanks for the question, Jonah. Um, so he's saying that I love the idea of a quick and dirty um, app, but um, it's concerned with some platforms having uh, a poor, poor user experience. And it also said, how do you handle when one app breaks down, it doesn't sync? How do you recover from last minute changes? So like, I, th I think that's one of the good things about no code is with um, with last minute changes, you can jump in and just click and edit straight away. Like you can just like drag and drop, click on whatever you want and make the, make the change. And in terms of the UX experience, like I think personally, I think the UX experience for the no code apps are actually quite good for the likes of that card um, website. It's you're it's effectively using a template that has sort of been built. Like um, they have they have tested the user experience from their side of things quite well. But um, I think if you if you want to build something pretty custom, that's where it sort of gets messy. Like whenever I was mucking about with the Yo delivery website. Like um, the user experience was terrible for ages, and like that was something that it sort of really annoyed me from being a designer. But it was just putting up a real quick and dirty app. It's more, the, the beauty of it is more the analytics side of things. So you can put Google Analytics on your product, and then you can um, analyze where people's going. For for example, with the delivery website, I can then see that like out of a thousand people, twenty percent have clicked on a certain product that's for sale, and ten percent have clicked on beer and whatever so I can get all this analytics back and then I can start making decisions straight away so I think that, I think the benefits sort of outweigh, outweigh each other so I think if you can build something fast and just sort of get feedback on it it's really good um, Michael I'll ask a question 
I was going to add one thing before that question. Um, that's true. Um, Go for it. <laughs> so you build it up to a certain level using the off-the-shelf products. If it suddenly flies and you realize you've, you've got something which is really valuable, do you then have to think, I'm going to have to move this on to my own proprietary system? Or can you keep it at that size? And if we were talking about, for Joe, you mentioned someone selling something for 20 grand. Can you sell a company built on the no code for that 20 grand? Or do you, yeah, what, do you, what happens if it does really, really well? That's, that's, that's the question. There's, there's two ways of looking at it. I think, you, yes, you can scale it. What, one of the good things about these no code apps, and especially the third parties, is that they all have their own APIs. That's, that's effectively how they make their money. Some of them are free and some of them are paid for. But essentially, what that means is you can you should drag and drop with your web interface to sort of get started. But then it has an API built into it, so you you can then hire an engineer team to actually use the system and all the data you've collected. So it can scale that way. For selling it, it, it depends on what the the person's buying. I suppose if they're buying the intellectual property of what's been built, then you need to look into the terms and services of what's you've actually signed up for. So that's where it can get complicated. And I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really know about that type of thing. But yeah. And it's why it's always important at the end of the day to read the terms of service. But I think at the end of the day, the, the beauty is that you're actually building a network and a community. So what people are actually going to buy for is actually this product that you've built, which is the community and the vibes on it and what people are doing on it. And that's what's for sale. Like, uh, they'll, they'll buy that and then they can do whatever they want with it. So I think effectively you can sell it over, but um, it depends more. It's, it's more about showcasing that in a way that's an valuable way to sell it. For example, with that... Um, no code API one, um, they would have got all the information on the community that on the users that everyone's involved with it. So they're getting quite a lot of valuable stuff off the whack. And then, do you want to ask your question as well about TikTok or? Yeah, I I, I, I live in a house, <laughs> my wife and a, a twelve year old and a ten year old girl. So all I hear about is TikTok. All I see is TikTok. They can't move with like doing things like that. <laughs> <laughs> our our grown ups is it is it gonna is it gonna move into the grown up world? Is business gonna start using it? Is it something I should get ahead mm. of the curve of, or just expect it to like everything that twelve year old girls love just disappear? Um yeah, well, David actually said to me, "Oh, are you on TikTok?" Like about two months ago, and I was like, "No, I don't do that." And then like, <laughs> and then I decided to try it out. And it's actually ridiculous the amount of engagement I was getting from those videos and them being so silly. Like, I got so much serious work off the most ridiculous videos. You know, like, it's, it's actually crazy. Like, I was having um, finance companies and lawyers contact me and I was thinking, but then you have to remember these people are human. Like, this is what I keep telling myself. Yeah. Like, people are human. Like, obviously, like... For some reason, when I first started making videos, I thought, oh, you know what? Like a lawyer's not going to find that funny because lawyers don't have humor. Like, <laughs> you know, like they're still humans. So I find that, um, yeah, I have got like a lot of um, reach off just making silly TikToks and in between doing business videos, yeah. um, just doing lighthearted fun videos in between. And I do think in lockdown, it's what people needed. I think they did need humor as well. Um, so it definitely did help me with business because I was. Um, so do you think it potentially could get serious? But that that was that's. The, the, um, the, I, I used it. Yeah, you know, I had to play with it the other night, and find it really easy to use to make mm -hmm. a little video with text on it and put it out free Twitter, and it was. I found it easier than Instagram, mm -hmm. but maybe that's just because I haven't spent enough time with any of these things really. But. Um, yeah, well, I know um, the only downfall with TikTok is that it is all filmed in portrait and portrait doesn't necessarily work on all platforms. Um, yeah. It is very, very easy to add it with it. It's so easy to add text. Um, but I would say, yeah, if you're looking to add it on TikTok, then maybe use um, Filmora Go to change it square. You know, yeah. that's what I've been doing sometimes as well. Um, another thing that crossed my mind there, I don't know why I didn't even think of it, um, the likes of the teleprompter question, um, all my videos aren't done in one take. Um, they're, like, a lot of people think that I do, I talk for a minute straight. I only talk for 10 seconds at a time. Um, 
like I'll head, I'll, I'll film and I'll say, hi everyone, so today I'm going to talk about apps. And then I'll turn it on and think, right, what am I going to say next? Do you know, <laughs> like, and, and that's what makes me more confident because I don't have to remember the whole thing. Um, and then just put it all together and film where I go. Yeah, no, that could be a good even answer for the startup pitch thing. It's just do multiple, 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 multiple. takes. Yeah, take loads of takes. Like, I'm actually going to show you. I'm going to be brutally honest here. Um, I'm just going to show you. I did a video earlier. Look how many takes there are. Look how many videos I have to put together tomorrow. And this is for like a one minute long video. You know, like I properly... I'll, I, I, like I, I have such a bad memory of what I'm talking about that I take it line by line and then just put the whole thing together. Um, yeah. No, that, that's even the same. Like I, I recorded a couple of po podcast episodes, and even I would do that with podcasting. Would be just to just record what I'm going to say and then just record it again, yeah, record it again, record it again, and yeah. you sort of get your whole thing out. But uh, it'd be interesting to hear for Jar's perspective on TikTok as well. But I think it's one of the cool things about TikTok is even to use it as a link funneling system because you can actually. Um, if, if you were to make, if we were to make 30 TikTok videos over the next 30 days or even the next two weeks, like um, the amount of people that are going to see that is, is, is massive. And then they can click through and they can just click through your website and you can actually just get loads and loads of people to go onto your website just through make TikTok videos. But the, but the if, other thing about TikTok, just uh, while we're on the topic, I'm not popular on the platform. Like my video, I had one video that got like 10 views and then I put it on LinkedIn and it got 30,000. <laughs> so yeah. again, it depends on the platform that you're going to share the TikTok video on. Yeah, I think it's the algorithm is hard to tell as well. Like with TikTok can just can so go viral straight away or if you've somehow hacked the, fire, the algorithm like you have maybe on LinkedIn, it can just go viral on LinkedIn too. But uh, Jar, what, what is your perspective on TikTok from a Singapore view? <laughs> is, it big, is it big in Singapore or? Yeah. Yeah, even even uh, most of the TikTok videos here, uh, they have verified accounts. So probably they work with the Ministry of Infocoms in back in Singapore. So even like uh, families, uh, parents are uh, doing uh, videos, and even uh, like what uh, she said, uh, you know, we are all humans. So I think TikTok is really great. But if you want to like get some engagement, some like views and probably some followers, which not on TikTok platform, but download the video and upload probably on some other social media platform. And probably you get some engagement over there. And probably, you know, uh, you will have uh, some response from there. But apart from just being TikTok, I think it's about all about creating content, you know? So like, as for me, I created uh, my own content. You can, I, I'm gonna drop the link here real quick. Uh, I just launch videos and uh, I did this for like people who wants to do uh, sorry like launch videos so I think launch videos is really great for uh, for people who wants to do like uh, you know they want to share their products or anything about their business so I have a whole bunch of uh, videos uh, that I actually edited so maybe maybe if you want to watch Maybe I can share here real quick. Just a minute. Uh, so this is uh, on Google Chrome. So I, I did some like uh, like podcast videos, so many kind of launching videos. Just bring it, I guess it's loading. So there was, there's still a lot over here. You can just scroll and see the playlist that I actually uh, compile it together. So I think TikTok is really great, but it's depending on uh, our creativity on creating the content and which is best to use for your product, for your niche. Because TikTok is uh, more for like uh, content that will uh, for, for human to human kind of thing, you know? The people wants to see another human. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Could you also right. uh, 
just tell us quickly a bit about Product Hunt? Because I know you mentioned Product Hunt earlier, but and you said everyone probably knows what it is. But a lot of people in this room might not actually know what Product Hunt is. So could you just quickly talk about Product, product Hunt from uh-huh. a community perspective and like what it is? All right. Okay. Because uh, a, okay. a lot of the... A lot of those videos you posted there that would have been made for people on Product Hunt, wouldn't they? Yeah. Okay. So a lot of people works on like their project or probably they want to work on their, you know, something like a product or service. So they want to, to really uh, share this on social media, right? So I think the best way to share is to write some description uh, just in point form or in bullet form. And then you need to have some like screenshots, like some of the things that you work on. And as well as like, I think videos is very important for engaging, just short videos, like 30 seconds I have, I, I guess. And I think Product Hunt is best to launch, a place to launch because uh, uh, it's not about the upvotes that you get because you know, there's a whole bunch of like products every day, like 50 of products almost every day, everybody's launching every day. And um, so I help other makers, entrepreneurs, founders, and, from all sorts of uh, different backgrounds from all across the world. And they always ask me like how to launch on Product Hunt and I will guide them. So I met a lot of people from offline and online to help them launch on Product Hunt. And uh, I can help them to prepare like what sort of materials they need, uh, where should they launch it, whether on Twitter, whether on Facebook, whether on LinkedIn or Instagram or anywhere. And then how do you actually get out votes and how do you actually reply? So you can hear feedbacks so that you can improve your product or your probably your features. Uh, so that's really important. So as for me, um, I, I was very active on Product Hunt, uh, just like a user. Uh, and then uh, I got awarded last year for a uh, community of the year uh, for Product Hunt. And this year, recently, uh, I won the Makers Festival for, for the COVID-19, like, like a hackathon. So there was like 500 people. Uh, building all these COVID-19 projects like data stuff, tracker and all that. So I built my own project. So I got, uh, you know, I got uh, uh, awarded for that. So I was very blessed and lucky and grateful. I think it's very important to know what you want to build and uh, how people actually understand your product and how you actually can get leads quickly. So a lot of people spend time building stuff over engineer, over market. They market too much. They're spending so much on social media, but they're, they're not probably getting leads or either they're, they're paying so much on advertising or something. So you want to build something real quick and you kind of just scale like, you know, for the first three months or something like that. Uh, so Product Hunt is really a good platform and you can see other people's product as well and you can learn really quickly. And there's so many tools. There's so many tools that you want to see or probably use and you can just search like, uh, you know, for podcasts or probably for Mac app, or probably Windows app, or probably uh, teleprompter or something, you know, or probably like a video call, video conferencing. So there's so many products that you can get by searching on Google. So it's on Google, you probably get the best one because people are paying for advertising, right? But on product kind, you get the best product because, uh, because it's being uh, upvoted by, by people who likes their product and as well as uh, the good products that curated and recommended by Product Hunt uh, team itself. So you can go to ProductHunt.com. Uh, they are based in San Francisco in USA. And um, you can ask me if you want to help me, uh, if you want me to help you probably to launch a, a product on Product Hunt. Yeah, like a digital website or app. So probably I can share with you some tips and tricks and probably some feedbacks and some reviews and just drop me like a DM on Twitter or anything, you know? Yeah. Awesome, bro. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks. I think that's probably going to round us up for the night. We have until half eight, but if anyone has any extra questions, feel free to jump in. Like, see Jack and Claudia here, and Marie, if you, if you have anything yeah. you want to add before we go, feel free to say say hello now. It's now's your, now's yeah. your chance. But if not, so I'll if, hand it. If anybody have any questions like uh, regarding about like starting a company in Singapore, or you know, in the ASEAN market, in the Asian region, maybe you maybe can ask me some question as well. So yeah, let's just hand it over to Michael to take take the end here. If you if you want, if you have anything you want to say about Reyes before we go, um, um, just just want to thank you all really um, so much for presenting tonight and for joining the call. It's been really really useful 
I know people have been on and off, but everything that we've heard have been so valuable, so useful, and absolutely brilliant. And um, we raise as an accelerator, the only private accelerator in the center of Belfast. We take in six companies every six months. Um, so if you know anyone who has a brilliant startup idea, which they are struggling to, to, to grow, to develop, or to take the next level, get in touch with us, we can help them any way we can. And we always come back to the wider ecosystem and the wider startup community in, in town in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and further afield. Um, we realize that um, like we've got six companies starting quite soon and three of them are from outside of Northern Ireland. So we, we reach far and wide and if we could have our first participant coming in for me, it would be absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, stay in touch, come to your other events. And next Thursday night, doing a really crap quiz. So still can drink about next Thursday night. It will be a bit shit, but you're all very welcome to come along. <laughs> yeah, so, thank you very much. Is, I guess Michael's fourth thank fourth you. round now of being the, the quiz master. So it, 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 it gets better every single time. Every time. The, ugh, anyway. Yeah. He has this a particular, particularly really cool round where he records his uh, record player and she gets to show you his uh, great taste of record music or of music. So we're that's running, my favorite we're run, round. David, we're running out of 1980s hits. That's that's the problem. That's sadly where the record collection ended around 1989. So we're running out. But hopefully, hopefully, hopefully next week. So the Oxfam will be open. You can get down and maybe check out, see what's see what's available. But again, just awesome to everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Neve and Ellie and Fajar. Thanks very much, Fajar, for tuning in. I know it's very early in the morning for you. Uh, you're all brilliant. And thanks, everyone, for sticking with us tonight. That was great. It's been incredibly warm here and humid in Northern Ireland. So you're doing well. I'm going to end it now. So see you later. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was brilliant. Bye. 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 B